Okay, we live, I think, in a, uh, in a world where lies increasingly abound. We live in a world where lies are increasingly common. Where do you think I'm going to go for an obvious example? Yeah. Let's take politics as an example. It used to be the case, believe it or not, that to be a successful politician, uh, that you had to be a person who demonstrated their integrity, to be a, a person who at least appeared to be a person of their word. It used to be like that. It's no longer, it certainly seems no longer to be the case, or to be like that, does it? Both sides of the Atlantic, it seems not just expected, it seems almost accepted by society that politicians will lie, many of them. It seems almost accepted by our culture that there will be spin in politics, right? There will be false news. It's almost accepted that's how it's going to be, that there will be deceit and deception. So we live in a world, not just a world of lies, we live in a world where lies increasingly abound. Well, as we listen to God's word this morning, what I think we're going to hear is a call for truth ring out. That in Matthew chapter 5, what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do this morning, I think, is appeal to us, his people, and to appeal to us to ensure that we have, you and I have, integrity in the way that we communicate, integrity in the way that we speak. So truth, a, a call for truth. But come on, it's been ages, it's been, it's been a lifetime since we as a congregation have been in Matthew 5, okay? It's been a long, long time, hasn't it? With stuff about office bearers and Christmas and, and, and so forth. So we remember what we're dealing with in Matthew 5. Do we? This is, obviously, it's the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? It's a sermon where Jesus is preaching up a mountainside and he's preaching primarily to his people, his disciples, his followers. Re remember that. We also remember, don't we, the main kind of theme of the this sermon. Jesus is showing us, his people, how to live under his reign. And he's kind of summed it up, or he will sum it up, with a key phrase that he mentions in chapter 6. I wonder if you can recall the phrase. Jesus says in this sermon, do not be like them. That sums it up, doesn't it? This is a countercultural sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? This is a sermon where our Lord and our King addresses us, speaks to us, and he appeals to us to be distinct and distinct from the world. So we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's fair to say, isn't it, that Jesus at this point has already covered a whole lot of ground, hasn't he? With the Beatitudes and the salt and light portions of Scripture. But again, I'm saying to you, can you recall where we are at this point in the Sermon on the Mount? Do you remember? We are in what I've called a couple of times the antithesis sections, the antithesis sections of the Sermon on the Mount. Why do we call it that? Because what is Jesus doing? He is contrasting his teaching with the teaching of the Pharisees, isn't he? Like he's taking what the Pharisees were teaching in the first century world. He's taking their errors and Jesus is using those errors to unveil to us the true standards of God and the true standards of the law. Now, if you were here before Christmas, do you remember we had portions about anger? I'm pretty sure everyone will remember we had an antithesis section about lust. Oh, yes, we remember that, don't we? And we had a section about divorce. This morning on the mountainside, the Lord Jesus enters the fourth antithesis section. And as I've just said to you, he is going to challenge you, challenge me about the way that we speak. So if you've got your Bible there, Please have your Bible, page 810, Matthew 5, 33. Have it open in front of you. And uh, we'll just try and highlight one or two things here. First thing that I want us to notice is the problem of the prohibition that Jesus gives. The problem of the prohibition. The 
problem of the prohibition. If I repeat the headings of the sermons too many times for you, be patient. I do it deliberately because the kids, some of them are trying to get the headings and to spell the words like prohibition. So the problem of the prohibition. So that's the first heading. Now, I say this quite frequently from the pulpit, but today I really do want you to hear it and I want to underline it that we have to here be very, 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 very precise with this portion of scripture. Like we have to be, we have to tread really very carefully with what we've got here. Or we're, do you know what? We're going to go wrong and we're going to go awry. So I would ask you, if you've got your Bible, to look at one verse, verse 33. And if I'm saying we've got to be very careful with it, let's read it very carefully, shall we? Let's try and establish what, the flow of what Jesus is saying in verse 33. So if you've got, all got it there, do you? Let's hear it. So Jesus is saying to his people, to us, again you have heard it said, so he's saying the Pharisees have said this, and what have they said? You shall not swear falsely, but you must perform what you've sworn. And then Jesus goes on to say, do you notice? But I am saying to you, I say to you, do not take oaths at all. Now, this is where I think we could go wrong. If you and I just glance over that, if we have a, you know, just a superficial reading of that phrase, those phrases there. Or if we take, and this is quite dangerous too, if we take an overly literalistic approach, then I think this is what we're going to conclude. That what Jesus is saying there is the Pharisees say, make sure you keep your word. But I am saying to you, don't give your word under any circumstances whatsoever. So if we just glance over it, take a superficial view, Pharisees are saying, make sure you keep your word. But I am going to go further and say, don't give your word in any circumstances at all. Now, I do not think that that fundamentally is what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us here. So here's the question. Where do we dig for gold? <laughs> where do we dig for gold this morning? First place we need to dig is into the context of this, okay? It's the first place we need to dig. Because you've heard, have you friends? Have you heard of the Mishnah? Do we know what the Mishnah is? Do we, we know, don't we, that the first century Pharisees, they had God's word. They had the Torah, didn't they? They had the scriptures. But what do we also know from earlier studies in the Sabbath day? That what the Pharisees did was add, didn't they? They added to scripture. The Pharisees added this whole legalistic framework. They added all these rules and regulations, right? They added to scripture in order, in their eyes, to protect God's word. Now, if you and I are going to understand this small portion of scripture here, what we have to appreciate is that the same is true of this topic. Listen to me. The Pharisees had developed this intricate, detailed system of oaths. Like they had all manner of oaths that they spell out in the Mishnah. They had oaths for different circumstances, different situations. They had different weights and gravity of different formula in oaths. And just to bring this out, I'm going to give you just an example and it'll blow your mind and you'll see how crazy these oaths were. So you ready for this? So this is what the Pharisees were teaching at this time here. That if you swore by Jerusalem, I swear by the holy city to bring back my election forms this evening. If you swore by Jerusalem, for the Pharisees, this was the most solemn and serious sort of oath you could ever make. You ready for the distinction? This is what the Pharisees were teaching. If you swore to Jerusalem, I swore, swear towards the holy city that I will bring back my election forms this evening. Then the Pharisees were teaching that wasn't a serious oath. And you could go back on that and you can break your word. Are you seeing it? See how crazy it was? Another one, if you swear towards God, very serious. If you swear towards heaven, not so serious. And you can go back on your word, and it doesn't matter if you break that. Now, if you look at your Bible with me, look at from verse 34 onwards, do you see it is this complex system of oaths that Jesus is speaking about? Look at it. 
Do you see how Jesus is speaking about uh, of the folly of distinguishing between oaths in heaven and on earth and uh, oaths and the hair of your head? So do you see what I am saying to you? We cannot just take this superficial glance at this portion of Scripture and think that we understand it. What do we have to do? We have to bear in mind the context. Second place we have to dig here, though, is into that question that perhaps right now is rattling around your brain. I think it's a totally legitimate question to ask in a way. This question, in Matthew 5, is Jesus point blank ruling out oath-taking? Is he? I mean, he says, you know, what is it? Do not take any oath at, at all. Is, Jesus, is this an absolute prohibition? Is he forbidding us to swear, take vows, and take oaths? Are you asking that? Are you? Um, well, the first thing I should say is that some have definitely taken that line with Matthew 5. Anabaptists from many centuries ago, or Quakers. Do we know what Quakers are? They're meeting houses scattered throughout. Uh, the UK, they take that line. So they'll read this portion of scripture and they will conclude you should not make vows or oaths. No baptism vows. You know, no baptism. Like uh, no ministerial vows. No, you know, when you're called into court for that crime that you've committed. Uh, I hope not. And you're asked to swear an oath. No, cannot do that. So some people have taken that view. I wonder as I speak to you this morning, if you can see where they're going wrong, they are not taking wider scripture into account. They're not reading this in light of wider scripture. What happens, Christian friend, if you go at the rest of the Bible? What do you see? Come on, we can do this together. Our God swears an oath. I mean, we are a reformed church. Don't we believe that? We know that our God has sworn in the covenant of grace, sworn to Abraham, sworn on himself to fulfill the covenant of grace. What else do we know when we look at scripture? The apostle Paul, does he not make a vow? Does he not swear an oath? Wait a minute, what about our Lord Jesus? I mean, was he not put under oath by the high priest? And what does he do when he's put under oath? What does Jesus do? Does Jesus say, well, I'm under oath, so I'm not, I'm not going to... No, Jesus embraces that and speaks willingly under oath. We definitely see here that oaths aren't inherently sinful. They are not wicked. It is not a wicked thing to say an oath. Absolutely. So what is it that our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us this morning here? Surely is this, that under his reign, as his people, that we should not be making oaths as a regular part of our everyday speech. Isn't that the prohibition here? It's not that we cannot make an oath in marriage or we cannot make an oath, a baptismal vow. It is not that. But it's that we should not be peppering our speech as Christians on a daily basis with promise after promise and vow after vow and oath after oath. We should not be making oaths as a regular feature of our ordinary speech. So that is the problem of the prohibition. The second heading, boys and girls, you're ready for it? Make sure you got it. Ready? It is, second heading is a positive rule for Christian speech. A positive rule for Christian speech. <coughs> We've uh, seen Jesus already teach us. Can, can I say, you, you accept this, it's not irreverent in any way. We've seen Jesus teach us negatively here. He's told us what we are not to do. Um, but if we carry on in this portion of scripture, uh, we see the other side of the coin. We see something much more positive. So again, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to direct you to scripture and to one verse, verse 37. Would you look at that with me, please? And we can see the positive rule for Christian speech. Do you see what Jesus says? Let's just deal with the first part of it. Jesus says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Uh, what you say. Now, I think if we've got a problem with what Jesus says there, surely it is not with what Jesus is 
<laughs> demand them from us. Like we understand. We under, understand. Let what you say be simply yes. What's Jesus calling for? He's calling for integrity in our speech and simplicity in our What's that sort of adage that we hear sometimes? Christians should say what they mean and Christians should mean what they say. Right? I mean, that's what Jesus, I mean, what, how does James put it? James says, you should not swear by heaven or by earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. If we've got a problem with what Jesus is saying there, it's not that we don't understand let what you say be simply yes. We understand it, don't we? Everyone in here understands it. I think if we've got a problem with us, the problem is why is Jesus saying it? Like, what is the logic here? Like, why is it our Lord? Why is it that regular oath-taking, regular promise-making is not to be a feature of Christian speech? Why? You see? Let me again make two little points here. First, we have to understand this. That it, regular promise-making, regular oath-taking, it fundamentally cheapens our speech as Christians. I want to speak personally here, although I always feel a little bit awkward doing that. I'm still going to do it. You can probably understand that as a Christian minister, I'm called to know this portion of Scripture reasonably well, and that I know it reasonably well. You probably, you, I, I, believe me, I'm not saying that I'm an expert or anything like this, but I, I, I've had to study this at university, and then I had to study this portion of Scripture at seminary, and then I've looked at it at home, and I've heard all through my life, you know, from my parents and other, I've heard Christians talk about promise making and oath taking, and here's confession time. Really, it's only this very week that I've begun to understand this portion of Scripture, I think. And it's only this week that I've begun to see how serious it is when Christians are throwing out promise after promise and oath after oath. And maybe I'm alone, and maybe you have always got this. Have you? Do you see why it is not right that Christians throw out oath after oath and swear after swear and promise after promise? Do you see why? Because it undermines the reliability of our normal speech. And I hope and I pray, and I really, when I say I pray, I pray that you will see that. Like, can, can, can you see it? Like, I say to you, look... I promise I'm going to do that. Look, I promise you can trust me. I promise I'm going to do that. See what I'm saying? What am I saying? I'm saying normally I'm not reliable. Normally my word is not trustworthy. But this time, this time you can believe me. Like normally, 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 normally. It's my word doesn't hold water. My word is not firm. But I promise, I promise this time, you see it? Do you see how it cheapens and undermines our regular speech when we make, we throw out all of these promises? If you do, what do you want to do? If you see it, what do you want to do? You surely want to run to what Christ says here, and you want to keep your words as a Christian simple and with integrity. We want to make our words yes and no, and we keep to it. But then the second thing I've got to say is even more serious than that is that regular oath-taking, in fact, any disingenuous speech at all, now listen to what I'm going to say, it is of the devil himself. And maybe, uh, maybe you just now think of my rocker, and like maybe you think that I'm trying to shoehorn talk of Satan and evil, into what is a simple matter of our words and our speech. But I'm not, am I? Because look at the end of verse 37 and look to see what Jesus says to us here. Jesus says to us, let what you, you say be simply yes or no. Now, anything other than simply yes or no, what does Jesus say about it? Anything else other than that comes from evil. Or if you're sharp, and you had your coffee. Look at the footnote. Did you maybe notice the footnote? So anything more than a simple yes or no is from the evil one. And for surely that is just this morning worthy of our consideration. 
Now, look, do, do, if you're here last week, do you remember how we described our enemy? Do you remember how he's described by God? He is the father of what? He's the father of lies. And so do you see it? He longs, longs for you to be exaggerating and longs for you to be breaking my promises. He nourishes these things. He entices you into. And so what happens when you and I, Christian friend, when we break our promises to our spouse and to our kids? What happens when we're outright lying? What happens when we're exaggerating things? What happens when we're speaking ill of someone and just, you know, enhance that a little bit, what they've done? What, 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 what do we do? We align ourselves to the evil one and we do what is displeasing in the sight of Almighty God. And again, I say to you, when you see that, when you realize that, what do you want to do? You want to go here, don't you? You want to keep your speech simple with integrity. Yes or no. That's the simple rule for the believer's speech, yes or no. So we see a problem with prohibition. We see a positive rule. And then a third thing, we see some personal application of Jesus' words. Some personal application. Hopefully you see that that is critical. It's one thing for us to see what Jesus is saying. It's another thing for us to be able to go out of this place this morning and work out, what do we need to do? How do we change things? Well, um, I want us to use our imagination this morning uh, just for a moment or two. Uh, and this will hopefully help the boys and girls to follow along. So boys and girls, you're going to have to listen really hard. You're going to have to imagine this, boys and girls, okay? So you imagine we're on a journey, and we're on a journey uh, to the land of God-pleasing speech, boys and girls. We're on a journey to the land of Christ, exalting words and patterns, patterns of speech. But there's a problem because on our journey to that land, our journey is currently blocked by a river. So we've got fast-flowing waters in front of us that block us to the path of fast-flowing speech. So what are we going to do? Do you know what we're going to do? I'm going to suggest three rocks that we can jump on to get across. Three steps that we can take to the land of God's pleasing speech. The first rock, friends, the first step that we take is to review our speech, to review our speech, and hopefully straight away you see the importance of that. What is happening in here just now? If we believe what our minister uh, Harrison has said to us this morning, that God summons us into the presence, into his presence, if this is us before God, what's happening right now? God speaks to us in his word, and what is he doing? He is confronting us and challenging us about our speech. Now, I'm saying to you, if that's what's happening right now here, does that not demand a response from every single one of us in Christ Jesus? Doesn't this demand a response? Like, should we not pause just now, this week, and analyze where we're not hitting the mark? Analyze where we're going wrong with our... And I'm turning this to you. I'm asking you, where is the problem here with you? Is it at work? Like, friends, are you misleading your customers and your clients in the workplace? You're guilty of that as a Christian. Are you guilty simply of just going along with the deceit that all of your colleagues accept? Is that where you are? Or is the problem with your speech and your words when it comes to relationships? Is that where your dishonesty manifests itself? Are you lying, Christian friend, about your past? Is it today in the present that there's all of these exaggerations? Is it broken promises, promise after promise to your sp Do you see what we have to do? We can't just rest in this. This is God's word to us as his people. We have to pause. We have to analyze. We have to review where we're missing the mark. But then we're in the waters, aren't we, boys and girls? We're on a rock. So there's a second rock before us. So you're ready for the next step that we've got to take? You ready for it? We surely then have to repent. I think this, I said something similar when it came to lust. But I think this, when it comes to our lies and our wicked words, we are adept at making excuses for ourselves, aren't we? Like, I do this. 
and I'm sure you do too, we play down the severity of broken promises, don't we? We play that down. Or we kid ourselves that our lies are unavoidable. Have you said that to yourself? I can't help it. It's the career I'm in. Everyone around me is dishonest. I cannot help it. I cannot help but exaggerate and lie. I can't. All my school friends are exaggerating and lying. Or it's the circles that I move in. I cannot help but do that, friend. If, as you review your speech today and this week, if God Almighty reveals to you your sin, what do you do? You must, I beg you, take action. And you must turn from those patterns of lies and exaggeration and promise making. Where do you turn? You turn in confession to the people who are hurt by this. Where else do you turn? You turn in confession to the Lord, your God. You bow, you repent of this sin. And then it's exciting, boys and girls, right? Because there's one last third step right ahead of us. So we review We repent, and then thirdly, we rest and rely on the Holy Spirit of God. Do you remember what I said at the start of the sermon? I said that we are in a world, you inhabit a world where lies increasingly abound. I think, honestly, of London, that we have a culture in London. We live in a city that actually actively encourages lies. It encourages lies. And because of that, maybe it's true of you this morning that you recognize your sin, but you feel helpless and you feel that you cannot change. There is nothing to get out of this pattern of exaggerating in school, exaggerating in university, making promises that you break, lying in the workplace. You're saying, it is beyond me to change. And as your minister, I say, absolutely it is. But it is not beyond your God. And surely that should fill us with hope this morning that God has not empowered you, Christian friend, with this vague uh, hope or uh, vague power. What has the Almighty God done? Yes, our enemy is the father of lies, but what has God done? You are indwelt by the spirit of truth. You're indwelt with the spirit of truth. It might seem impossible for us to change our patterns of wicked speech. It is not impossible to God because he's the rock. The Holy Spirit is the rock that can bring us into the land of God-pleasing speech. And then we'll close with this fourth thing in a word, the purpose of Jesus' words in Matthew 5. Because maybe there is a thought that you have in your head just now. Maybe it's the same thought as you had in the sermon last Sunday night with the deacons. And maybe you're thinking, is this, Andy, is this really all that important, this sermon this morning? Like maybe you think, well, look, you know, Jesus... I'm preaching about the standards and expected of Christianity, and I see that anger is really important for Christians to deal with and lust. I see that, man. But integrity and simplicity in the way we speak, in the way we speak, is that really important? Is this a big deal? Is it really a big deal? And I'm sure that some of you are asking that question this morning. But do you really not see why it's a big deal? Is it not because truth is everything for the Christian church? I mean, you see surely what God has done for us. He has revealed by his grace to you, Christian friend, he has shown you by grace ultimate truth. He has shown you true truth. What do we know by God's grace? That the Lord Jesus Christ is not just the one who bears witness to the truth. Who is this Jesus that we love and proclaim? Who is he? He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is why it's so important. 
And so I say to you, friend, if you are not a Christian, if you are not in Christ this morning, understand this, that in the gospel, what is God offering you? He is offering you salvation from this world where lies abound. That's the good news before you. You are offered a rescue from deceit, deception, broken promises. That rescue package is before you. And is that what you want for? Is that what you long for this morning? To be free from the deceit you know is in your heart. Like the dishonor and the broken words. You want to be, you want to be free from that rescue, from the guilt and the punishment of that. Well, if so, I think I can make you a legitimate promise this morning. If you come today to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and belief, what will happen if you come to Christ? You will today know the truth. If you come to Christ, and the truth will set you free. Friends, let us bow our heads before God and let us pray.